I think that you know, this conversation around belonging is a deeply important thing for us as young adults. For me, life can endlessly remind us as, as young adults and as human beings how difficult it is to actually find space to belong. I first moved to Canada three years ago, and I was uh, coming straight out of the mission field in Central Africa, and I was excited to start this new life. I was engaged to Emily, ready to get married, ready to, to start a new job, new home, new country, and I felt like, okay, this is a place that I can really belong. I was never quite sure where I'd fit in in Africa, you know, because it's not easy to fit in in Africa when you look like this. And this was about as tanned as I ever got as well after three years in Africa, so it's really hard to fit in. So I was excited to say, okay, maybe this is a place that I can call home. And then that hope came dashing to the ground before I even landed in Canada on the airplane. As I was flying, the air hostess came around and she said very politely with that kind of faux politeness, you know what I'm talking about? It's not exactly real politeness, they kind of hate your guts, but anyway, she said, would you like anything to drink? And I said, sure, I'll have a beer. Right, so blank faces, so you see where I'm going with this. She said, I'm sorry, sir, what, what was that? I said, I'll have a beer. She looked at me again and then the faux politeness went up and she went, I'm sorry, sir, I don't understand you. And I said, <laughs> I swallowed my pride and I said, a beer, and she said, oh, a beer, so it was, so that was when I realized that this probably wasn't a place that I was going to easily find myself belonging. Now, I want to try as we might if, if sometimes belonging isn't easy to come by, if actually it's difficult for us to find a space in which you can really be authentic, in which you can really be yourself, and, and probably nowhere is this more profoundly an important question than it is for this generation. How much of our lives as young adults, as, as millennials, as some people call us, is shaped by this desperate search to belong, to find a community in which we can truly be ourselves? In 2011, a, a study was done sociologically across, I think it was the United States, and they found that 86% of millennials suffer acutely and regularly from loneliness. 86%. The same study found that 18 to 24 year olds are four times as likely to feel lonely on a regular basis as people over the age of 70. Which is to say that, that ours, yours and mine, our generation is probably the loneliest in all of history. We're probably the, the loneliest and most seemingly disconnected generation in all of human history, which is weird when you think about it because we're also by far the most connected in history. You've probably heard of the theory of six degrees of separation. This was a theory that sociologists came up with in the 1960s when they did a massive uh, data compilation of realizing that there are only ever six degrees of separation between you and anybody else in the world. That it only takes six connections to get from you to anybody else on the planet. And that turned into the terrible, terrible parlor game, Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon. Have you ever played that game? If tonight goes really badly, we'll just end up playing that around tables. So let me know if that's where we need to go. Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon is a game that really, you know, if a dinner party has really gone south, you have to pull this one out, and it starts to pull things back. The basic principle of the game is that you think of an arbitrary uh, random actor, anyone that you can think of, and then you find six degrees of separation to get you back to Kevin Bacon. So a movie that they've been in with that other actor who's been in a movie with that other guy who's been in a movie with Kevin Bacon. So there are only ever six degrees of distance between you and Kevin Bacon, which is really, I mean, if you didn't feel significant in your life before you came in, now you should. Of course, that also means that there's only ever six degrees of separation between you and the African grandmother who lives on the plains of Kenya. There's only six connections of difference between you and them. Now, the reason this is interesting it's because last year, Facebook did a massive data compilation of, of what this meant now uh, that we live in the age of social networking. And what they found was that where once there had been six degrees of separation, there's now 3.5. That now we are uh, twice as connected as we've ever been before. We're more connected than ever, and yet for all our connectivity, we struggle to find real community, don't we? Sometimes we struggle to find a place in which we can belong. For all our progress and connection, the distance between us is actually greater than ever. That actually our incredible hyper-connectivity has done nothing to curb the deep hunger that we have for belonging. The uh, social psychologist Roy Baumeister said this, the single strongest predictor of happiness 
The single strongest predictor of happiness is whether someone has a network of good relationships or is alone in the world. This isn't in the Bible, and it's not from Deepak Chopra or like Oprah or anything. This is a social psychologist who's pointing out that the research unanimously suggests that more than money and health and achievement and success, the single strongest predictor that you will feel happy in your life, that you will feel fulfilled in who you are as a human being, is if you feel that you belong to something that is bigger than yourself. Which is why the quality of life diminishes profoundly when you're not in community. Think of elderly people that you know. Or think of the trend amongst the elderly in our society who feel so disconnected from their families. People who once had this incredible community and then have lost it. They suffer from deep depression and anxiety. That kind of disconnectedness can actually lead to physical effects, like cognitive decline, even a, a, an increase in the rates of infection amongst the elderly. Which is to say that the need to belong is actually built into us. The need to belong is deeply embedded in our DNA. It's part of the fabric of what makes us human. It's how we're designed. And so then, is it a coincidence that we watch the rate of things like depression and anxiety go up in the same integer to which we watch the distance between us growing greater? Maybe this is why our generation is the most connected, yet also the most lonely. Maybe it's why our generation suffers with the highest rates of mental health disorders and anxiety and depression. Because if it's true that happiness and fulfillment is a product of belonging, then we have to ask ourselves, why is community such a difficult thing to come by? When you talked about uh, the question around your tables, what kind of things came to mind when you think of spaces in which you most belong? Well, my hunch is that you didn't think of many arbitrary spaces, the kind of spaces that you're just thrown into as a human being and, and, and the spaces that it takes to get between different places in the world. You probably didn't necessarily think of places like work or school or college, the places that you go to do your groceries like Superstore. You probably didn't, I'm guessing that nobody here said, I most belong on the LRT because it's the most human contact I ever get. Now, that might be true. On the LRT, you might be squeezed in like sardines. You might spend more time pressed against people on the LRT than you sometimes do with your spouses. I don't know. But the difference is there's no actual connection. It's proximity, but it isn't relationship. My guess is that when you thought of spaces in which you most profoundly feel you belong, there were places in which you look around you and see people with shared values, people with shared experiences, People with shared interests. Because you see, belonging is predicated on certain conditions. Belonging isn't something that just happens. It's what happens when two people realize about the things they share in common. And they choose to, to live in it and dwell in it and practice it. Have you ever experienced going into a new place? Maybe a new workspace or maybe some of you have just started university. And you step into that environment and realize you don't know anybody. Maybe everybody else there knows one another apart from you. You're the only new person in the room. And you're unsure of where you fit in. And then you meet somebody who has the same sense of humor as you. Have you ever been in that kind of environment where it's like, I don't really know where I land here. I don't know where I fit. And then you hear that voice across the room make a sarcastic, dry comment. And you think, that's so dry and sarcastic. They could be English. I'm going to stick to that person. And what do you do? You gravitate to them. You, you stick to them. You spend time around, around them because what you share brings you together. And ultimately, that sharing becomes friendship and it becomes belonging. This is most profoundly true with your family. You might not like them. You might not want them to be your family. You might avoid them like the plague, but you share something that fundamentally keeps you together. Something that you can never uh, disconnect. You share DNA and blood. You share stories and life and history. And that creates this inseverable connection that try as you might, you can't break. See, belonging is about what we share. It's about finding people with shared values and interests and personality and history and experiences. And that's the most beautiful thing that there is about belonging. But here's the, here's the piece. It's also the most problematic. Journeying with people who share the same interest as you can become a deeply problematic thing. Because we gather around what we share, but that thing that brings you together can very, very quickly instead become the boundary that you set around your little group. 
that you start to say, if this is what we are like, if this is what we share in common, then it means there's other people who don't share that with us. That if, if we have to guard our sense of belonging, it means we have to keep other people out. That we're like this because they're like that. It's us and it's them. And so the thing that drew you in, the thing that gravitated you to this community, instead becomes the demarcation of who you are. And before you know it, community becomes clique. How many of you ever experienced when community, this, this gift of God, instead becomes clique? When we set borders and boundaries around it. When belonging instead becomes life in a bubble. This was like when I moved to Canada. And the air hostess was said with everything that she possibly could, this is not your home. That it took something as small as not sharing experience, something as small as not understanding me on my terms to remind me this is not yet where you truly belong. Now the reason I talk about this is because I want to ask this question. How much does this define people's experience of the church? This is fundamentally the question we want to wrestle through for the next few weeks and then into the coming year. How much does this sense of belonging and bubbleness or community or cliqueiness define people's experience of the Christian community? In a, in a world and a culture and a generation that's so desperate for belonging, desperate for finding something bigger than themselves that they can be a part of, it's never ever been so important for us to ask, what defines and shapes us as the Jesus community? What, what is the center point that draws us together? The thing that we share, the thing in which we belong, or what is the thing that sets a boundary around our community and makes it difficult for people to come in? Is church a place that people can feel they can belong to? Or do they need to meet certain shared conditions? Do they need to have our values and our vision and our understanding? Do they need to speak our language before they can inhabit this space? When I was at university, there was a, a church just near my house, and I just loved walking past it every single day. It was this old, run-down stone building, and I swear, on a good Sunday, it could have squeezed in 20 people. Just the most beautiful building. And uh, outside of it, there was a gate that went all around the building, and it had um, a lock and a padlock on it, just like this one. And above the door of this church, there were just three words, strict and particular. Well, the church said to people, with the words above the door, with the size of the building, with the padlock on the gate, was there are certain beliefs and certain behaviors that you will have to prove before you can ever be allowed in the door. That what they said was belonging in this community isn't something that just happens. It isn't something that you can just step into and find your way in. Belonging in this community is predicated on what you believe. It's predicated on the way that you behave. And so the church, like us that wants to be open and invitational and irresistible, often we still build our experience and our, our vision and values on what it means to belong because you believe. We never say that we're strict in particular. Apart from this church, I don't know any church in the world that would ever say that. But sometimes we can say it with everything we do. Have you ever been into a church community and realized that you just don't understand the words that are being said? You don't understand the kind of jokes that are being told. You, don't, you can't get on board and translate the way that people interact with one another. Because sometimes a lot of what we do says that to belong, first, you have to believe. And the reason this is a problem is because this is not Jesus' kind of community. Jesus had a radically different way of doing and building community. And that's what I want us to dive into tonight. And it's going to launch us into this conversation over the next few weeks. Let's read this in Luke 5. It says, After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi, Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law complained to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. 
Let's think about that for a second. If you've spent any time at all in the church, you've probably read this story or other stories from the Gospels that sound a little bit uh, similar to this one. But think about how radical a thing this is. That this is Jesus at the beginning of his ministry. He's an up-and-coming rabbi that most people have maybe heard of on the fringes, but aren't exactly sure what he's about. No one really knows what his message is. No one really knows what his mission is in the world. And he stumbles upon a tax collector, someone on the margins of society, someone who most profoundly knows what it is to find, uh, to struggle to find a community in which to belong. And he says two words to him. And those two words are enough for Levi to leave everything behind, to leave his livelihood, to leave his income, to leave his home and his security and his insecurity and his fear and his disappointment, to leave it all behind because instead he wants to follow Jesus. Have you ever really wondered what it was about Jesus that made this kind of an encounter possible? Or ask yourself this, what would it take of someone to come into your life and be so charismatic and so inviting that they are able to convince you to get up and leave everything at two words, follow me? Well, a pretty good answer is, it's because he's Jesus. But you can't really argue with that answer. That's a very, very good theologically sound answer to the question. But I have another theory as well. And it doesn't discourage the idea that it is just because he's Jesus. So hold that, that's very true. But notice this. Jesus invited people like Levi to belong to something. He invited Levi to become a part of a movement, but get this, he did it before Levi knew whether or not he believed Jesus' message. He invited him to belong before he believed. Jesus never turned up in anyone's presence and gave them a prescriptive list of doctrine and belief that they needed to sign their initials next to. He never talked to people about what it means to be a sinner and what it means to have eternal life as the fundamental concept you need to understand. Instead, he said, follow me. You see, those, those theological pieces, the belief stuff is things that you need to pick up later on. Beliefs that would develop once people had begun the journey of ultimately belonging to Jesus. Jesus simply invited them into something that he promised was worth their entire life. Think about it differently. Think about it this way. How long did it take the disciples to pick up on who Jesus actually was? Can you point to any disciple, if you know anything of the Gospels, who when they first met Jesus, fundamentally understood who he was in its totality, his character as God incarnate, God in the flesh? No. It took the disciples years to realize that this man that they were following had a greater significance than they could ever imagine. Which is to say, if a Christian is someone who confesses that Jesus is Lord, can we all agree that that's a, a fairly reasonable depiction and definition of what a Christian is? A Christian is somebody who confesses that Jesus is Lord. Well, if that's the case, then the disciples didn't become Christians until years after they'd started following Jesus. The disciples didn't confess who Jesus was until years after they'd started following him because they belonged to Jesus' movement before they were sure whether or not they believed his message. There's something about the invitation of Jesus to them that made him and his movement utterly irresistible. And then we come to the church. And sometimes the church is tempted to flip the order, to say, believe, and then you're invited to belong. That often the church has predicated its understanding of believing on first, uh, uh, sorry, its, its understanding of belonging on first believing. And belief kind of becomes a metric, doesn't it? Do you believe what we believe? Do you behave the way that we behave? You see, belief is what makes a community that's designed for a radical openness into a bubble. It's what sets boundaries around the community because it's what we share and it's what brings us together. But when it's done wrong, instead it becomes the demarcation that says, this is us and that's them. And Jesus comes along and radically reframes the idea of what it means to belong because he comes with just two words. Not, here's what you need to believe to get in. Not, here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to change before you're accepted here. He comes along and two words, follow me. Not follow me and, follow me but, follow me. He doesn't come along with an invitation to convert to Christianity or to a prescriptive set of beliefs. He comes along with an invitation to belong to something bigger than yourself. And he says, maybe belief will come later. 
Before I was a Christian, I did uh, an alpha course. Has anyone here done an alpha course? Does anyone know of an alpha course? An alpha course is a great space for people to find a sense of belonging in the Christian faith before they're sure whether or not they believe, and to ask big questions, to wrestle through the kind of pieces uh, that sometimes we're afraid to wrestle with in church. And the alpha course is, is a pretty good format to shape some of what we're going to be doing at 1830 uh, going into the future. And so before I was a Christian, I joined onto an alpha course. I'm not going to lie, it was run by my mom, so I was kind of dragged along because it was in my house. Uh, so it didn't really count for anything, actually. But, but when I was on the alpha course, I, I really considered myself an academic. I'd wrestled for years with deep questions of spirituality, questions that, that fundamentally we need to wrestle with, uh, but I couldn't come to any answers. And I was connived into Alpha because my mom said, that's a great place to, to get your questions answered. And again, it was my mom running it, so she was the one giving me answers. So it had absolutely no effect on my life. But there was somebody else uh, in, on the Alpha course who had a profound effect on my life, and his name was Tommy. Actually, we called him Tommy the Chicken Man, not because he was like the worst superhero ever, uh, because he, he, his job was working with chickens. It's, it's as simple as that. Now, Tommy had uh, deep uh, learning difficulties. Uh, and on top of that, he didn't have any family. He'd lost all of his family, and the family he had left had really abandoned him. So he was on the margins of any community. He couldn't really ever find a place to fit in, and he was very socially awkward, and he was a hard guy to talk to, and he didn't really make any sense. And, and we stepped onto this Alpha course together. That's where I first got to know Tommy. When I was on the Alpha course, I made it my mission to deconstruct everything that I could about the Christian faith to lay it out in front of me and examine it and, and ultimately to criticize it and demolish it in the hope that I could find some glaring holes in this, in this faith and this religion because I needed to believe my way into belonging. I knew that before I ever called myself a Christian, I would have to understand everything I could about this faith. And what I realized was that Tommy, while all this was going on for me, was having a very different experience. Tommy, at some point in that, uh, over the course of, I think it's 10 weeks, gave his life to Christ, um, long before I did, which was years later. And after he'd done that, he became the bane of my life for the remainder of this Alpha course, because we would talk about big questions of judgment and sin and suffering, and I would really try to understand and deconstruct what we were getting at. And Tommy would always turn around and say, why don't you get it, Adam? <laughs> like, why are you so slow? Why are you so stupid? It became the bane of my life, because try as I might, I couldn't deconstruct it in any way that Tommy really cared about. And here's why, here's what I realized, this, which is why Tommy really changed my life. Tommy didn't believe his way into belonging like me. He didn't need to deconstruct everything and then put it back together again to understand what it meant to be a Christian. What happened for Tommy was that he found a community in which he was accepted. He found a community he could belong to, whether or not he was really sure if he believed what they did. And ultimately what happened was that community shaped who he became. Have you ever wondered why Jesus attracted people like Levi, people like Tommy the chicken man, people who are lost and left behind, people on the edges of society and community? Well, my theory is it's because they are the ones who often aren't distracted by the stuff that we can be easily distracted by. Distracted by what it means to make sense of life and, and pain and suffering and big questions of spirituality and significance. That's important stuff that we have to wrestle with. But there's people on the edges, people who know what it is to be distanced from community, who realize that it isn't first and foremost about believing, but it's first and foremost about finding something you can belong to that shapes who you become. As we bring this into land, Nathan Albert said this, anyone can belong, regardless of their orientation, regardless of their beliefs, regardless of whether they're even Christians. They're included, loved, embraced, and welcomed into a community of Christians. And then, only after belonging, do they begin to hear about Jesus? Do they see Christians acting in countercultural ways? Do they learn about this Jesus who claims to be the Son of God? I wonder if we have this amazing opportunity uh, as the church in the 21st century, not to be a curator of a belief system, not to say we are strict and particular and here's the laundry list of things you need to abide by before you can belong here, not a place just for those who believe the way we believe and behave the way we behave, but actually to be a movement that's bigger than any one of us, a movement of people who are pursuing Jesus together. Pursuing Jesus in the company of people wherever they are at on their own journey. 
Jesus built a community around the basic Christian principle that God loves you without condition. That there's nothing you can do to make God love you more and nothing you can do to make God love you less. And the most authentic and and effective way to preach that message is not to stand on a pulpit and it's not to stand on a street corner and it's not to yell over sandwich boards. It's to let people belong to this community without condition. To practice unconditional belonging because that teaches of an unconditionally loving God. So as we close, I want to pray for us. And and here's another question to wrestle with. You don't have to take time to wrestle with this together, but I encourage you as you're leaving tonight to think about this and to talk about it as you go. How can the church be a space where people belong before they believe? Or maybe you just need to wrestle with, do I actually agree with what that mad Englishman is talking about? Is this something that I can really get on board with? Or has he missed something? These are questions that we need to ask. As I said, we want to be a conversational community. We want to wrestle through these things together. We want to learn in dialogue and grow in dialogue. So let me ask us this. How can the church be a space where people belong before they believe? Do we need to change the way we talk about people outside the church? And instead of calling them non-believers, maybe call them people who don't belong here yet, who haven't found a way to belong and land here yet, no matter what they believe. What's the sign on top of West Side's door? What do we say to people without ever really saying it? What are the boundaries that define this community? Is it dogma and doctrine and beliefs and behaviors Or are we defined by a common pursuit of Jesus, no matter where people are at in that journey? 